The subject that we're going to talk about, that Julie's going to talk about, is one that is in, in extremely important for this country. Because it is the coming together, finally, of people from different tribes, if you will, different kinship groups. Mm -hmm. And at this particular session, what's really important for you to try to grapple with is not just mixed race, but black and biracial. Because it is the black strand that informed my life, my mother's Portuguese, and her life, as well as being biracial. We grew up 22 years apart, so we had a different macro environment that we grew up in. I expected nothing. I integrated every school I went to. Julie expected to be a real American. And hence, her story is different from what my story was. The other piece that I would like for you just to try to cling on to is how proud I am to have a sister who is so brave and courageous that she would tell her story and with the authenticity with which she lives her life. She is brave, she's courageous, and she happens to be an excellent writer. Who knew? <laughs> Um, oh, with that, I um, invite, I introduce my, my sister, Julie Lithcott Haynes. Mm -hmm. I didn't know there were this many people in Provincetown in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> sure that everybody is here <laughs> and I know who to thank for that my dear sister um, and her wife Billy and Gina Lithcott and Billy Avery are s proud to be residents of this community have felt embraced by all of you um, held loved we the Lithcotts when we visited have felt loved and embraced wherever we go on commercial street mm -hmm. you know Oh, you know, you're related to Angita, you're related to Billy, and somehow extra love comes our way. And so um, thank you for having me to your town um, in the dead of winter. I, I live in California. Um, I packed one pair of socks. <laughs> um, um, because it was colder in Cambridge where I just came from. So this is pretty cool temperature. Really nice. Um, so, um, so thank you for having me and for bringing out your folks. It means so much to me that y'all are here. My mother also happens to be here. She decided to fly this way and to join me on this leg of the book tour. I'm on about a 13-day leg, which will take me to three other states before I get back to California. And my mom said, you know what? You're going to P-Town. Let me come. I'd love to see Billy and Angina. And because my parents spent uh, the end of my father's life on Martha's Vineyard mm -hmm. uh, in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Mom is going to be going back with some of her friends who managed to come. Roberta and Lori uh, came up from the vineyard to be here. Mom's going to go back to the vineyard with them. So thank you, Mom, for being here and being part of this. You've managed to be in a number of my reading audiences, and every time it's a special reading for me uh, when you're here, because obviously you know the story better than anybody. So my mother, Jean Lifcott, everybody. Mm -hmm. I've already mentioned Roberta and Lori. Um, there are friends of family. There are um, friends of friends of mine here. I met Arana. Where's Arana? Who knows one of my college friends, Megan Maxwell, who lives in Baltimore. Megan's on Facebook telling people to go to Julie's events. Yeah. So here you are, Arana. The magic of social media. It's amazing. But Lori Schaller, I just have to give a special shout out to. Um, when I needed a copy editor for this book, when it was my master's thesis, when I was getting an MFA in writing, they said, you need it professionally copy edited. That was their requirement. So I said to mom, does Lori still copy edit? She said, let me ask. The answer was yes. And I expected line edits back from Lori, and I got them. But what I also got when we picked up the phone um, was a voice with tears. It was Lori Schaller, who is uh, a white female rabbi, <laughs> telling me, Julie, what you've written about, about your life as a black and biracial woman resonates with me so much. 
as a Jew, as a woman, as a rabbi, mm -hmm. in the life I have lived, mm -hmm. I, am, um, I have had similar experiences and similar stories. And so I hope that wasn't too much of a share, but to know that somebody, <laughs> right, right, to know that somebody who's led such a different life felt seen a little bit um, yeah. in my words mm -hmm. was quite a gift. So thank you, not only for the work of the copy editing, um, but for showing me your heart when you, uh, and I spoke about it. Um, a bunch of you are strangers to me, and I want to thank you, perhaps most of all, because you don't have a family reason for being here, you know, you're not my friend, you're like <laughs> taking a chance on a stranger on a Saturday afternoon when you could be doing any number of other things. So thank you for giving me your time, taking a chance on, on my book and on my reading. Um, I want to thank Brittany, who's not here. I want to thank Nan, who opened things up. Everyone who works here at the Provincetown Library. I want to thank Jeff from East End Books P-Town, mm -hmm. who's set up outside. And if you decide you like what you hear uh, and you want the book, he'd be happy to sell it to you, and I'd be happy to sign it for you. Mm -hmm. um, I decided when I began um, on this book, I decided that whenever I had the opportunity of a book tour, so I decided that when I um, went out on my book tour, that um, whenever I had the opportunity to be in a venue with an audience, with a platform, a stage, if you will, the opportunity, the privilege um, to be with other humans around my art, my writing, that before I read, it has been a tradition on this book tour that I step aside and make room for somebody younger than me on this journey mm -hmm. as a writer, as uh, an African-American writer, and so I would like to uh, introduce to you Jessica Williams. Jessica's a sophomore at Nauset High School. Mm -hmm. She lives in Brewster. She writes prose and poetry. I believe today she's sharing a poem. And her father, Ronald, is in the audience as well. So oh. Jessica, please come up and share your poem. I feel like my skin is too tight. Encasing my bones, it restricts my breathing. While on the bus sometimes I feel and imagine the eyes and stares and attentions of my sanctimonious classmates rest on my shoulders and the back of my neck, sending goosebumps all down my arms and legs. God only knows it's better, much better now, much better than it used to be. This isn't the past where you would wait in feverish anticipation to hear hatefully charged epithets so ceremoniously draped upon you. We've certainly grown since then, my peers and I, at least I hope so. I know who I am, but sometimes you can't help but hiding behind half of your heritage in an attempt to illegitimize the other. These traits, these habits and beliefs need to be unlearned, I know, but it's difficult when these beliefs keep staring you in the face. We're not that different, I pray and fear when the eyes of my peers, standing as judge, jury, and executioner, rest heavy and foreboding on my fragile frame. Headphones act as a shield from any harsh words, looks, or phrases heading my way. I don't want my ideal of myself to be corrupted by their wandering stares. But still. Sometimes I rebuke myself for writing self-righteous poetry about a world I know nothing about, a world that has neither condoned me, condemned me, or claimed me as its own. My hardships pale in comparison to those who have truly suffered for their differences. I know this and I am glad my experiences thus far have been safe, but that feeling of otherness is one that is hard to shake. My difference is prominent in the way I have look, speak, carry myself, and navigate the world. Growing up here, different in any way, sets you apart, whether it be your blackness, queerness, or anything else. Maybe that's something I should learn to embrace. Maybe that's something I am embracing. I love who I am, but it's sometimes difficult to reconcile others' perceptions of you with the person you know yourself to be. I'm working on it. I'm only a kid. I have some time to think. <laughs> farther down this path than I was when I was your age, and I'm happy for you for that. Mm -hmm. The world has changed. Mm -hmm. um, 
and also your family has a lot to do with it and the community in which you live and who you intrinsically are. I'm so happy for you and really appreciate your joining me on this journey. So I have a signed copy of my book for Jessica and an honorarium because we must pay artists. <laughs> write a memoir. I think when you write memoir, you must be aware that it can be seen as the greatest act of navel-gazing. You know, why is my life worth sharing with others? What gives me the right to take up the space on a page? What gives me the audacity to think that I might pour my stories into a book worth reading? So I, of course, have asked myself this question. There's a new uh, collection of essays out by a woman named Morgan Jenkins. The, uh, the subtitle for the book is Living at the Intersection of Black, Female, and Feminist in White America. That's her collection of essays. Mm -hmm. The title of the book is This Will Be My Undoing. <laughs> and I thought, absolutely, this will be my undoing. Uh, it could be. I've chosen to put um, some of the most personal, vulnerable stories from my life into this book, and I've had to ask myself why. Um, I did it to heal myself. I did it to um, know the truth of what I had experienced. But then I got some feedback along the way in a writing program that maybe what I had to say would be of use to others. And my thought was, my goodness, if what I have experienced could be of use to somebody else who's made, been made to feel like the other in this country, then I want to share it with that person. Mm -hmm. And of course, so many of us have cause to feel like the other in this country, as folks here in P-Town know better than most. And so I have been delighted in the three months three and a half months my book has been alive to hear from folks, black folks and biracial people and people of color more broadly and queer folks and poor folks and immigrants and people who belong to unpopular religions and <laughs> people who are um, gender non-binary, people who have cause to not know where they belong in a country so insistent upon knowing who you are, mm -hmm. what you are, where you're from, mm -hmm. all of that. Um, I am black, I am biracial, my mother is white, my father, uh, who's been gone 22 years, was African American. We were middle class, and then I became upper middle class um, as I became more educated um, and had greater opportunities in the workplace. Um, I was raised in all white communities. Uh, owing to my father's success, he was a physician, trained at Boston University Medical School, graduated in 1943. His father, an African American male, was a physician graduated BU Medical School also. Wow. So I come from, th I'm third generation African American college educated, which is a rare, rare thing in this nation and I am proud to be descended of George Lithcott, the, the second, and George Lithcott the first. And then we go all the way back, as we know, thanks to the work our brother Stephen did on the geneal genealogy of our family, that we go all the way back to a slave named Sylvie who lived in Charleston, South Carolina in the late 1700s. And we trace her back to about 1783, when our country had just been formed. Mm -hmm. We know that she was not regarded as a human being, but by those who formed the country or who made the country, founded those, put those documents together. But she was our great, 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 great grandmother. And I don't care what the United States of America had to say about Sylvie, she was a real American. Mm -hmm. And I call my book Real American to honor Sylvie, mm -hmm. who back in 1783 lived here and because of what she endured, made us. Um, I was raised in all white communities. My father um, helped eradicate smallpox in West Africa in the 60s. Um, yeah. He was Jimmy Carter's assistant surgeon general, so he rose to this position of prominence, um, and we were proud of him, uh, and he was magnificent. Um, the opportunities he was able to provide me enabled me to get a good high school education. I went off to Stanford University, I went to Harvard Law School, I became a corporate lawyer, I became a university dean out at Stanford. Um, I left all of that dean work behind five years ago to get another graduate degree, an MFA in writing, um, to write a book on the harm of helicopter parenting called How to Raise an Adult, which was uh, born from my observations as a dean of a freshman at a place like Stanford. Um, and when I wasn't writing about the harm of overparenting, I was writing about race. 
that's what kept coming up and asking for my conscious attention. Mm -hmm. So that is why my second book is this memoir on race. I want to be clear that my story is not about suffering. I have not suffered. I have had a privileged life. I've got socioeconomic class privilege. I've got light skin privilege. I've got a lot of gender privilege. <laughs> I've not written about suffering. But I have written about, I think, the fact that racism is agnostic to how many degrees you have. <laughs> racism is, a, racism mm -hmm. is agnostic to class or who your daddy might have been um, or still is. Um, and my story is about how, as a young child in America with brown skin, and a black father and a white mother, I learned pretty quickly to loathe myself, that something was wrong, that something was terribly wrong <coughs> with me, with my daddy. I could tell the eyes of strangers, some strangers, not all strangers, the eyes of strangers told me there was something wrong with brown skin. And uh, so my journey has been um, to love this self regardless of what some people in America might think of people like me. And. Um, a good book has an arc to it that takes a reader on a journey. We're supposed to build suspense and tension and so on and this and that and kind of keep you turning the page and then there's the big uh, you know, climax and then the denouement. My book has an arc and I think of it instead of as a letter A, it's more of a letter V. It's a pit that I descended into. So I go from, it begins like this, an American childhood of a coming to other, desperate to belong, self-loathing, emerging, declaring Black Lives Matter onward. And so I'm going to try to read today uh, a, from a few bits um, to try to give you a sense of that journey. Um, and, um, and I will try to give you the heading of these nine parts as I, as I flip to, to the next one. All right, I'm going to start in Becoming the Other. When I was three or four in Sneedon's Landing, New York, I'd begun to sense that something might be wrong with people with dark skin. I lacked the language to describe it and the intellect to analyze it, but I felt the chill of it in my bones, the red-hot heat of it surging up the back of my neck when I was out and about with Daddy. Daddy was six foot two and lean. With a neat, tightly coiled afro, he kept supple with afro sheath and skin that was dark and crinkly, like the top layer of a brownie. <laughs> On those occasional weekend days when he wasn't traveling or busy at the desk in his den, he'd take me with him on an errand in town and every now and then to an event in Manhattan. Holding his hand, walking down the local street or a bustling city sidewalk, I noticed that some strangers stared at him with eyes that steamed like a cauldron as if they could brand him like an animal with their searing focus if he dared to look them in the eye. I'd look up at my tall daddy for reassurance, pleading with my small brown eyes to know what was going on. But he gripped my hand tighter, kept his eyes focused straight ahead, pursed his lips, and kept walking. When I walked down the same streets with my white mother, nobody steamed at her that way. The glances she got as a white woman holding the tiny hand of a small brown child were far more subtle. It took a lot longer for me to discern and label those looks as pity and disdain. By choosing to marry my father, she'd crossed a line. By choosing to have me. We moved from New York to Wisconsin and then to Reston, Virginia. Um, when my father was working as Assistant Surgeon General under President Jimmy Carter. In fifth grade at Lake Ann Elementary School in Reston, Virginia, one of my white friends got pulled into the gifted and talented group. She was smart, but no smarter than I was, I knew. <laughs> and now she was getting to do cool projects and puzzles, but not me. I went home and mentioned it to my mom who came to meet with my teacher, Mr. Polanski. <laughs> but Polanski was not persuaded. So my mom escalated to the principal, this time insisting that I be tested. They brought in someone from the district to give me an IQ test, mailed the results to our house. Mom thought I wasn't watching when she opened the envelope, read the results and squirreled the letter away in a drawer. Mm. I was put in the gifted group soon after. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, Mr. Polanski announced mm -hmm. to our entire class, mm. 
Apparently, all it takes to be gifted is for your parent to meet with the principal. But in the privacy of an afternoon home alone, I peeked at the letter from the district. The raw score was 99th percentile. As my teacher stood smug at the front of the classroom, it was the first time in my young life I uttered a very silent, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> we leave Northern Virginia because Reagan beat Carter and now moved to Wisconsin to an all-white community. I'm in a high school of 1,200 kids, almost entirely white, couple Jewish families, and us. I spent a lot of time at my best friend Diana's house, and she at mine. One day during sophomore year, when I'd gone over to her house to hang out, I found her in the basement rec room watching a movie on her VCR. It was Gone with the Wind. She looked up at me and said hello. Then she turned her gaze back to the television screen and sighed like a southern belle. Wouldn't it have been great to have lived back then? <laughs> Oops. No. Why not? Because I would have been a slave. Oh, but I mean if you weren't black. <laughs> but I am black. I don't think of you as black. Mm. I think of you as normal. Mm. <laughs> Summer after sophomore year, I was on an exchange trip, a language exchange trip to France with a different school. I stayed behind after our language lesson one day to ask the professor a question and then found myself walking back to our Paris youth hostel alone. I came upon a small park where a little white girl of no more than 10 was kicking the gravel out of her shoes. As I neared, she stopped what she was doing, looked up at me, and spoke. Pourquoi tu noir? Why are you black? Decades later, I would read the work of Franz Fanon, who had also had a humiliating encounter with a little white French girl. But on that day, as a 15-year-old walking through Paris, I was alone with just my rudimentary French and my fragile sense of self. Pourquoi tu noir? she demanded. Hmm. Parce que j'ai de la chance. <laughs> ah, because I am lucky, I told her. I didn't believe it, mm -hmm. but I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I hoped my words would send this little stranger home with some big questions. <laughs> Maybe they'd even fuck her up a little bit. <laughs> As far as I was concerned, she was every white person who had ever questioned my right to exist, to be a regular person just going through my day without drawing the scrutiny or fascination of others. I didn't want to make excuses or give this little girl a lesson in anthropology. I wanted to fucking shine. I wanted to shine so fucking much that that little white French girl would ache to be me. Ache like me. At the start of my senior year, I was serving my class as vice president, and I was president of the entire student council. The Cosby Show had debuted on NBC in September, with the show's father, Cliff Huxtable, played by Bill Cosby, being a doctor like daddy, and the middle daughter, Denise, kind of looking like me. There was finally a fictional family on the TV screen that resembled mine. I was glued to it every Thursday evening, reading it for guidance about how to be someone like me. I had turned 17 that November, a few weeks, sorry, I turned 17 that November, a few weeks after the presidential election that re-elected Ronald Reagan. My best friend Diana made me a huge birthday locker sign filled with words and images cut from the pages of Tiger Beat, Seventeen, and other teen magazines. She'd woken up extra early to get to school in time to tape it to my locker before my arrival. We did this kind of thing for each other. Her birthday was earlier in November and I'd festooned her locker just the same. I entered the school, actually I'm gonna read a little bit more of this because my family's here. <laughs> Something about turning 17 made me want to look like the woman I was becoming. Getting ready for school that morning, I pulled the curling iron through my hair over and over and over again and smoothed it into a nice, sleek, low ponytail that would hang from the nape of my neck. I'd spent a few extra moments on my makeup, carefully drawing the charcoal eyeliner across my lids, swishing the black mascara along my lashes, contouring my cheeks with chestnut blush, and painting my lips raisin. 
I'd selected a beautiful black wool dress to wear, a professional cut with long sleeves, a round neck, and the shoulder pads that were the fashion at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pulled my nylons over my strong calves and thighs, and to finish the look, I wore a pair of black patent leather pumps that made me three inches taller. Decades later, I would read a short story by Julie Oranger that described a middle-aged woman as, quote, no longer ripening, but not yet deteriorating. <laughs> Back at my house on that November morning on my 17th birthday, I was ripening, beautifully, and I knew it. I drove the snowy route to school, pulled my car into a spot in the far parking lot, got out and walked on tiptoe toward the main building, deftly avoiding the permanent fixtures of ice and lumps of hard snow that clumped on the asphalt in wintertime in Wisconsin. As I walked up to the main entrance of the school, I saw my reflection in the glass doors, my dark figure silhouetted against the bright white snow behind me. I entered the school and headed left toward my locker, which was located in the bank reserved for seniors in the central hallway near the administration's offices, conveniently close to everything. Even above the din of student voices and slamming lockers, I could hear my heels clicking with precision on the shiny cement floor. I could already see the birthday locker sign, 50 lockers in front of me with its five sheets of white paper taped one to the next to the next in a sort of vertical column with shimmering silver ribbons taped to the top and sides and spiraling out into the hall. I felt a surge of anticipation of the attention I would get that day. A friend shouted happy birthday as I made my way down the hall and I nodded, smiled and shouted thanks. When I got to my locker, I stood and admired Diana's creativity, reading from top to bottom all the bits of language, looking at all the imagery she'd gone to such trouble to cut out and glue on there for me. I opened the locker, put my backpack inside, and pulled out the books I needed for my first two classes. Then I turned and smiled at someone else saying happy birthday, clanged the locker door shut, and twisted the combination lock a few times. I strode down the main corridor toward my first class, feeling like I owned the place. Some unknown minutes later, someone took a thick black marker and wrote N-I-G-E-R in three places on my birthday sign, even spelled incorrectly. I knew what they'd meant. I spotted it in late morning during the passing time between classes and immediately my mouth went dry. I stood with my back against my locker, affecting casual, as the other students opened and shut their locker doors. After an excruciatingly long three minutes of metal scraping on metal and the roar of chatter and movement and a few more happy birthdays, mm. the hall began to empty as kids went off to their next class. The bell rang. I walked quickly toward the school office, which sat at the crossroads of this hallway and the other main hall. The hallway ramped up just before the intersection and at the top of it I paused, my chest heaving, my mouth still dry. I had to get my shit together. Mm. The glass-walled office was around the corner to the right. I took a deep breath, then drew my spine up straight, smoothed my ponytail, straightened my dress, plastered my most pleasing smile on my face, and strode with casual confidence over to the glass door of the main office and flung it wide open. As president of the student council, I knew all the secretaries. Marie sat at the main desk and didn't bat an eyelash over why I was not in class. I asked her if I could borrow a black magic marker. She fished around in her drawer. Will this do? I took the marker from her with a smile, thanked her, pushed the door open, and walked out of the office. At the intersection, I scanned all directions, then turned left and walked quickly back to my locker. When I reached it, I looked down the long hallway once more to make sure no one was coming. And then as the silence pressed down around me, I took the cap off the marker and began to draw neat black lines over each iteration of the word. I now had three black boxes where the words had been. I turned around and pressed my back into my locker, still clutching the marker, my knees sinking a little bit toward the floor. At day's end, I took the sign home. In the privacy of my bedroom, I pulled my senior year scrapbook from the bookshelf above my desk in my room and opened it to the first blank page. There, I pasted my birthday locker sign accordion style so that it could be completely unfolded to resemble what it had looked like hanging on my locker. Before closing the scrapbook, I took a pair of scissors and like a surgeon excising tumors, removed the three iterations of the shameful word and threw them in the trash. I closed the scrapbook and returned it to the shelf containing the recorded history of my childhood. 
Over the Christmas holiday, I typed my college applications on a brand new Apple IIe computer. <laughs> my parents were among the first to buy. In March 1985, the first internet domain name, Symbolics.com, was registered. In April, I accepted an offer of admission to Stanford University. A classmate, Harris, had applied to Stanford but had not gotten in. Harris and I were in pre-calculus together, the highest math class offered at our school, and it was held during the seventh and final period of the day. One day in April, right after the bell rang, signaling the end of class, the end of school, Harris's father walked in, sat down at an empty desk next to mine, mm. and began talking to me in a playful tone. So, you got into Stanford. I looked up at my friend Harris and silently asked, why is your dad here? Then I replied, yes. So, what were your SAT scores? I replied, do you think it's fair that you got into Stanford over Harris when his scores were higher than that? Harris was not the president of the student council. Our grades were roughly the same but I had stolen his spot at Stanford with my blackness. I told no one about the locker sign, and I'd go on to tell no one for decades. Not my parents, not the school, not my boyfriend, not my best friend. For more than 20 years, though, the truth of that day hunkered down inside of me and metastasized. I was the nigger of my town. And now this is from Desperate to Belong. So I'm now a freshman at Stanford. I got a 2.0 my first quarter at Stanford, a B, a C, and a D. <laughs> and I was pretty sure this was the evidence of what Harris's father had been hinting at, mm -hmm. which is that I didn't belong at Stanford, mm -hmm. that I had been admitted for reasons other than my intellectual capabilities. We now call that stereotype threat, that when we're members of marginalized groups about which negative stereotypes are held, when we're made aware of that stereotype or when we get evidence of our own um, behavior that seems to fit the stereotype, that we then are laden with the stereotype and we believe it and can underperform accordingly. This is work of Claude Steele at Stanford's psychology department. I didn't know any of that then. It's now spring quarter. I'm starting to take classes I like, which I've been told will um, help me be successful. Um, when you're motivated because you like the subject, you do the work. Um, it's a political science class, civil rights and civil liberties, with 200 students. <laughs> Later that spring, Professor Steyer asks a very tough question in our civil rights class, which was not unusual. What is unusual is that I know exactly what he's getting at, and I ache to respond. <laughs> but to date, I'd never raised my hand in a class at Stanford, and I still don't dare to do so. Besides, this is obviously a really complicated question. No one else is raising their hand. My fear of being wrong, of being black and wrong, mm -hmm. silences me, even though I know I have a good idea here. Scanning the huge room for potential volunteers, Steyer glances at me. Something in my face must be showing him my brain is working overtime. He nods once at me, raises his eyebrows, signaling <laughs> that I should speak up. Bless you. Thank you. Well, I begin clearing my throat and playing with my hair, and then I keep on talking. Professor Steyer, never one to downplay a dramatic moment, <laughs> folds his arms across his chest, yeah. steps back on one heel, and starts nodding vigorously at me as I'm responding. <laughs> so I keep going. My classmates, watching the clear evidence in Jim Steyer's behavior that I am saying good stuff, <laughs> begin scribbling down what I am saying. I am teaching my classmates. I am speaking from a place grounded in knowledge and bolstered by the tiny bit of confidence I'm getting from my professor, with a voice pushing through the brambles out into the clearing. This is the starting line of my efforts to be better than whites expect a black person can be, a race I'll run and try to win for the next 20 years. And now I'm moving, I'm jumping a lot, and jumping about 20 years um, to 2005. This is a section that is self-loathing. So it's the bottom <laughs> of my sense of self. Um, I'm now uh, assistant vice provost for undergraduate education and dean of freshmen at Stanford University. I have practiced law for four years, and now I've been a university administrator for about seven years. 
On August 29, 2005, Katrina makes landfall. And the levees do not hold as the army knew they would not. And water sweeps life out from under the living. In New Orleans' Ninth Ward, black people on rooftops wave signs hastily scrawled on pieces of cardboard. Help us. The people plead with their bodies and their signs, sure as the helicopters fly over that their government is coming for them, will help them. Instead, the government flies by. Over 30,000 residents stream into the Louisiana Superdome, a building whose roof would leak, whose air conditioning and refrigeration would fail, where without enough food, water, restrooms, or restroom supplies, these residents would live for five days. As the Superdome grows more dank with a stench that is a mixture of rotting food, urine, and feces, the government relocates people to the Astrodome, over 350 miles away from their homes in Houston. The Astrodome and the organizational wherewithal of Houston's local government save the day and save lives. Some evacuees will stay for weeks, some for months. The former First Lady of the United States you know where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the most woke audience I've had. <laughs> Let's just enjoy this. <laughs> the former First Lady of the United States, Barbara Bush, takes a tour of the Astrodome on September 5th, 2005, when it is brand new in its role as savior. She chortles. So many of the people in the arena here, you know, were underprivileged anyway, so this is working very well for them. Most of us black folks are Democrats. We believe as Democrats that our government is an organization that will be there for us even when our fellow citizens who see us as the other seek to shut us out, kick us out, shut us down. But in late August 2005, we, those who live in the Gulf Coast, we who have loved ones there, we who have no connection to the area but watch on TV, learned that our government has had no plan for us. Mm -hmm. Them niggers should be grateful, she might as well have said. Mm -hmm. Here, have a hot dog. We gave you a damn hot dog, dog. Be grateful. Pledge your allegiance. Stand for it. Stand. Mm -hmm. This is from Emerging. Um, I'm still Assistant Vice Provost, Dean of Freshman, an ed, a consultant, an executive coach has been brought in to help me and my teammates work better together. We, about three or four of us, report to a Vice Provost. Um, he's a white male professor of engineering. My colleagues who are at my level are all white women with PhDs. I'm not only the only person of color, I'm the youngest. After about, nine, and, and when they first brought the coach in, I thought my job was to tell her what was wrong with everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought I was doing great and like, hey, let me help you figure out what's wrong with all these other people. <laughs> After about nine months, I think some of you who know my family are like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> I'm very little out of you. <laughs> I know. I know. My family's like, did you have to say that? And I just want, yeah. we're not hiding from anybody. <laughs> After about nine months of working with the vice provost and his direct reports, Mary Ellen, the coach, has conducted a 360 degree review on each of us, mm -hmm. and she's ready to tell me how I'm perceived, regarded by my colleagues. By now, I trust her enough to be able to listen to the feedback. Too emotional too aggressive. <laughs> Might as well give me a list of stereotypes of women and black people and black women and tell me not to do any of those things, I told her. And she lets me continue. <laughs> yes, I have a tendency to blurt things out when I get really moved by something or frustrated, but my emotion is warranted. Is it getting you what you want? She asks me. When I practiced law, my passion and anger could be channeled into useful <laughs> argument. But in academia, it seems to just push people away, and then I'm the one who has to apologize. I want to know why I'm this way, I plead. That could take about 20 years of therapy, she tells me, chuckling. Mm -hmm. She says, how about we focus on when you're this way, so that you can start to notice the emotion coming, and then decide what, if anything, you want to do about it. Mm 
<clears throat> what, if anything, I want to do about it. I realize Mary Ellen isn't siding with stereotypes. She's telling me that my power lies in being in charge of my voice. With Mary Ellen's help, I begin taking notice of my behavior. When I feel a strong emotion coming, instead of acting on it, I try to pay attention to what I am feeling and where I feel it in my body and what triggered the feeling and I write it all down. When these feelings arise in meetings with my colleagues, I have a little code for how to respond, D-D-E, which stands for don't dwell, excel. For weeks, my meeting notes are littered with this tiny notation. Over a few months of this close attention to self, of mindfulness, I begin to be able to sense emotion coming. I can then pause and ask myself what is going on and tell myself that I am okay while the conversation around me keeps going. I begin to see that the trigger is a feeling of being overlooked, doubted, or dismissed. I begin to see that my fear that I will be judged as not good enough makes me desperate to prove constantly that they are wrong. I begin to see that I can't control anyone else's opinion or behavior that the only thing I can be in control of if I work hard at it is myself. With Mary Ellen's guidance, I begin to see that I can love and accept myself regardless of what others may or may not be thinking of me. I can choose whether to speak or not, whether to be silent or not, whether to go off on someone or not, <laughs> rather than simply let those impulses happen to me. As her coaching begins to impact me, I feel renewed. With the help of Mary Ellen, a white Buddhist Aikido master, I begin to emerge into a healthy black self. A day comes when I summon the guts to tell Mary Ellen one of my most painful secrets, that as a child I hated being black and was afraid of some black people. This gut spilling, fear sharing, loosens up knots of shame in my psyche, loosens the muscles not just in my mind but in my soul. Speaking this awful truth out loud through tears needs the pain out of me. The relief feels astonishingly good. I wake up the next day no longer feeling the vice grip of racism that made me loathe myself and by extension my people, that asked me to prove I was good enough despite being black. I look in the mirror and allow myself to see not what whites might see or what they might want to see or what they might want not to see, not conforming to what they admire, to see my actual self to see the color of my face and body, paper bag brown in fall and spring, high yellow in winter, milk chocolate in summer, and accept that some in America see me as the other and being fine with that. To see my skin and hair and hear my quote white speech and decide that it's not up to some committee on blackness to anoint me as black. <laughs> it took me 40 years to stop twisting and turning this way and that in response to how I feared and hoped people of both races would see me. I drive to work that day having shed the loathing of my black self and by extension of all black people from my eyes, which had prevented me from really seeing other black folk. I look on, on the Stanford campus, I look into the eyes of one, then another, then another, then another black person and I feel my heart swell with feelings like compassion, admiration, love, even desire, as if discovering their existence their magnificence for the first time. It might as well have been the first time. Like climbing out of a deep depression, I hadn't known I was this afflicted until I wasn't. White Americans, you are infatuated with the Statue of Liberty, whose tablet contains words of welcome for all, who did in fact welcome you and your ancestors. And you are simultaneously infatuated with carving lines and borders between who does and does not belong here, with yourselves on one side of the line and the other half of America on the other. You think your whiteness makes you better than the rest of us. You make us your scapegoat, your excuse for your violent rage. It's not all of us, you say. Stop saying it's all of us, you say, my white brethren because you want to be treated as an individual instead of as a stereotype. <laughs> and I will get out of bed anyway and go out into the streets of America to do my work, to find true love, to raise children who know how to work hard and be kind to others, to speak. This is from Declaring. <clears throat> We the people cannot continue to abide the stories of police and civilians on witness stands, 
telling us that in just seeing our black bodies, they were terrified. <laughs> you have to be terrified for a justifiable reason. God gave us this black and brown skin. The skin God gave us is not a reason for you to be justifiably terrified. We are terrified <coughs> of you. We continue to try to forgive, to live. Even dying and in death, it seems, we deserve no human mercy. Eric Garner told police, I can't breathe, when they had him in a chokehold for selling cigarettes illegally. Tamir Rice lay gasping for breath, his toy gun on the ground nearby, and the policeman standing over him did not offer CPR to this 12-year-old boy they knew by then was only a child with a toy gun. Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown were left dead on the sidewalk for hours, their bodies unclaimed. The local police do not even lift these boys' bodies off the sidewalk, do not properly care for the corpse. The mothers frantically call, text, plead, have you seen my son? Please help me find my son. White people, we win some small victories, but America behaves as America does, and we experience small slights and enormous tragedies committed by you. My nephew is a 41-year-old black man, and he was at your house the other day because he and your husband are old friends, and he was in town for a meeting in our town, so he stayed with us, but he came over to your place to hang out for a long, long while. And my nephew, he left his shoes behind at your house. How does a man leave a house without his shoes is the kind of question left in the wake of my nephew. <laughs> my nephew, who from the San Francisco airport as he waits for his flight home to JFK, texts me, can you get my shoes from my friend's house and mail them to me? Sure. So I drive over to your house, which is in my neighborhood. And it is evening and it is dark. And I park my car at the curb and make my way along the stepping stones of your manicured walk. And I ring the doorbell. And to the left of the large door is a picture window with drapes only partly drawn against the dark night. And from a warm living room, your little blonde girl peers out at me and then turns around and tells you something. <coughs> then you answer the door. How can I help you? And I just want to pick up some fucking shoes left by my nephew at the home of his close friends. But instead, I perform. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Lifcott's Aunt Julie. I'm here what? Yes, sorry to bother you, but I'm here to pick up my nephew Michael's shoes. You're... Yes, my Michael, he apparently left his shoes. I gesture to the pile of shoes visible in the foyer behind you. He texted you or told you I'd be coming by to pick up his shoes. He called you. You hear the name of your close friend, my nephew, now for the third time. Your foreboding facial facade gradually falls away into a relaxed smile. Oh yes, of course, you say, stepping back, sweeping your hand across the vestibule of your doorway as if to invite me in, relief visibly slaking off your once rigid body. And you point at a pile of shoes where my nephews lie indistinguishable in the heap of your family's shoes. And you make some statements about how you love my nephew. Mm -hmm. And I plaster a false smile on my face, which you know is false. Mm -hmm. And my nephew's shoes are a size 12. And when you hand them to me, they leave their absence behind. An absence you will stare at after I leave. And even when you take your toe to the corner of your husband's shoe and kick it so it fills the space left by my nephew's, you will remember my nephew's shoes. Mm -hmm. My son. <clears throat> I look at the faces of Trayvon, Freddie, little Tamir, who is all of 12, and I see you, my son, my precious son, my beautiful black boy so smart and bookish and inquisitive and philosophical. I see you grow taller, grow muscles, grow a man's face. And I weep for the future self who will leave this home and discover that in pockets of this great country you're loathed, feared, and worse. My son, you did not ask to be born. I chose you. I asked you to be mine. I gave you this skin of brown. 
and you are exquisite beyond measure. This is Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> Trayvon was my Pearl Harbor. The line demarcating before and after. The moment I knew blackness is the core chord in my life. Because whatever, despite my strange and perfect history inadequacies as a, with a, as a person, blackness, a black person, a, a mother, my inadequa, because I am raising a black son. He was murdered on February 26, 2012, not in Ferguson, but in Sanford, Florida, a neighborhood a lot like mine. I read of it a few days later, I read of it a few days later in a small newspaper, weeks before March 17th, which was when the New York Times would pick up the story. The Zimmerman verdict of not guilty on all counts came on July 13th, 2013 and plunged like a cannonball into the murky self-loathing in my psyche and displaced every bit of that self-loathing. And the water that rushed back in its wake was a torrent of bitter tears and anger. And the calm stillness that followed was pure love for my people and for Trayvon. When I see his face, all I see is my son. You hiding there behind your draperies across the street, it was you acting like Zimmerman who called the cops about a quote disturbance in your neighborhood. You, who said there were multiple juveniles who do not live in the area or, quote, have permission to be there, which you know because you guard the white experience and you know who belongs at the pool and who does not. It was you who saw a black man getting into a nice car and decided he was stealing it and called the police who trailed him, pulled him over, and pounced five at a time on his 25-year-old black body, this former student of mine, this man now getting a PhD in engineering at Northwestern, driving his own damn car. It is you who call your dogs, who bring their dogs to bring us down, to keep America white, to buff us out of your existence. You want to stand your ground? It means arm the whites. You think if given the choice, any of us would have asked to be born black in America? You think we want to be the object of your evident fear as you pass us on streets and crowd away from us on elevators? In the wake of the Zimmerman verdict, the artist Questlove wrote so hauntingly about this. He described himself as a six foot two, 300 pound black man and pleaded, I have to be somewhere. I mean, what can I do? I have to be somewhere on earth, correct? Correct. Sometimes I do wonder, where is God in all of this? But then I think maybe God did give us a choice. Maybe he gathered a group of volunteers. Maybe, sorry. Maybe he gathered a group of souls and asked for volunteers. Maybe he said, now who wants to go down there and inhabit a black or brown body? Who wants to take that on? Who wants to live a life in America where you may be treated like the scum of the earth? Who will walk among white people and be their opportunity to learn compassion? And the bravest souls looked around at each other and raised their hands. Let's hear your questions, your comments. Don't be shy. We're only talking about race. <laughs> <laughs> it is so special for me, as you can imagine, to have my mm. sister here. <laughs> my other sister here. Because they know the people I'm crying about and loving on. Mm. All right. Thank you. A little bit about Avery, says Billy Avery. My daughter is Avery. My, I'm married to a white Jewish guy named Dan, and um, which is so complicated. 
<laughs> we've been together for 30 years. I met him when I was 20, I just turned 50. And we've been married for 25. And I will say to you now, I say in the book it was inevitable that I would marry a white guy because I had been raised in white communities and I had been, um, I had received the message from America that in order to make it, I had to please white society and that I spent a whole lot of time trying to never be called the N-word again. Uh, trying not to meet with the scorn or disapproval of white people. And within that context, it was quite inevitable that I would date and fall in love with and marry a white guy. So I say in the book, Dan was inevitable. Um, the white guy was inevitable. Dan was not inevitable. Mm -hmm. He's magnificent and loved my, my black hair before <coughs> I did. Mm -hmm. I used to press it, keep it straight, so try to do what the white girls did. And he saw it curly one day, wet. We lived in the same dorm in college. And um, I came out of the shower with my robe and my little shower caddy, and here's my corkscrew hair clinging to my face. I never left the room with hair like that, I want you to know. Like, I always pressed it, makeup, hair. And my boyfriend comes around the corner, and he says, you have curly hair. <laughs> and I remember the boys in my all-white high school who teased me about my hair. And so I, I stepped back, and I said, yeah? He said, I love it. <laughs> and I thought, what? <laughs> and uh, so I say my white Jewish boyfriend helped me love my black hair. Um, so we got two kids. And we have a son who looks like me, um, is phenotypically black. He is a little bit darker than me even. He is not ambiguous racially. I mean, you know he is a man of color. And um, my daughter resembles her dad more. And she could probably easily pass in a group of white folk. And. Um, my heart aches for her, mm -hmm. for what it might be like to be in the presence of racism mm -hmm. and have to decide, do I stand up for my people, my mother, mm -hmm. my ancestor Sylvie, she knows she's from Sylvie, or do I sit here and just, is it easier, safer for me in this environment to say nothing? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we think passing is the easy way out, mm -hmm. but when you can pass and yet you know who you're from, mm -hmm. it sucks the soul out of you. Mm -hmm. I hope that does not happen to my daughter. Um, so I try to raise her to know who she's from and to be proud of that, not just her black ancestors, but her Eastern European Jewish ancestors, mm -hmm. who are her father's people, and my mother's people, who are Yorkshire coal men. And uh, you know, I have taught my children that they come from people, some of the most reviled people on the planet, <laughs> and they came from people who survived. Mm -hmm. So that's my girl, that's Avery. And um, one day I was saying to her, she's 16, and beautiful and smart and kind, funny and an artist. And I was saying to her, you know what, baby? Sometimes uh, we were joking about, uh, like for example, Sawyer is our son, and um, we we tell the kids what we might have named them if we hadn't, you know, the short list of names, you know. And on the short list of names for Sawyer was August, because of August Wilson, because August, you know. It's the month when we got married, but we named him Sawyer. I inadvertently named my black son after <laughs> fictional <laughs> most mischievous white boy. <laughs> Which I, I wasn't thinking. I wasn't conscious that if I was the woman I am now, I would have done a lot of things differently. So I was telling Avery, you know, something, we're talking about names, and uh, about the names we might have named her, if not Avery. And she said, I kind of wish, you, you should have named me Marin. And I said, well, that was one of, on Daddy's list, you know, but I didn't really like it. And, and then I paused and I said, I kind of think we should have named you Sylvie, our slave ancestor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Avery said, oh, Mom, I'll name my daughter Sylvie. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So that's in the book. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you wanted me to say about Avery, but is that good? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I loved and I thought it was it's so effective to talk to white America in a very blunt and in blunt language, you're talking to me, and I, you know, accept that. And it, it's, 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 it's not shocking, but it's like, wow, I'm getting a message here that I want to hear, need to hear, even as someone who may think he's not prejudiced, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, and in that favored white class, even mm -hmm. though, uh, and and part of my my gay self can identify with with what you're doing. With the otherness. Especially when I was a kid. Yeah. Thank what you. is your name? Thank you, Roger. Roger. Thank you for saying that. That was really beautiful. Um, 
you know, and I'm not necessarily talking to you, Roger. Um, I, I do that play of, you know, calling all white people yeah. out, and then the response, like, wait a minute, it's not all of us. And then I get to say, like, yeah, of course, you want to be treated as an individual instead of a stereotype, which mm -hmm. we members of marginalized groups, including gay folk, don't ever get the benefit of. We are treated, you know, as a group. Right? <laughs> One of us does something wrong, it's all of us mm -hmm. that did it, right? So I'm playing with that, you know, when I use the second person. I don't know who's listening and feels I, that, that I'm speaking to them in any given moment. Um, so I'm, I really try, I use the second person pretty rarely, but when I do, um, you know, I'm hoping that there's an impact. I'm hoping that there's a, whoa. Yeah, there and is. so thank you for saying that, Roger, because um, that is my aim, um, not to hurt you, um, but to jostle mm -hmm. folks out of complacency. a complacency. Mm -hmm. um, Beverly Daniel Tatum, who wrote Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? A seminal work which came out 20 years ago. She's just released the 20th anniversary version. She's the former president of Spelman, mm -hmm. lives in Atlanta. She says, there's active racism, which is like a moving walkway in an airport. You know, so you're on it, you're trying to get from here to there, and you're on the moving walkway. If you're actively racist, you're actually walking as well. You're on the moving thing, but you're bringing your own effort so that you go even faster, okay? The active racists are the white nationalists, you know? They are, the, the and the neo-Nazis, and the, right? We know who they are. And they're not good people on all sides. Those are bad people. <laughs> To be passively racist is to be on the conveyor belt and to be moving in the direction because society, this society, this America was built on the premise that whiteness is better than everything else. Mm -hmm. So to be passively racist is just be kind of going along. You're moved along with that privilege of whiteness or the racism of society which privileges whiteness carrying you. Beverly Daniel, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum says we have to actually all be actively anti-racist, mm -hmm. which means if we're on a moving sidewalk called the racism that runs the show here in America, we have to turn around and walk faster than the conveyor belt would otherwise carry us. That's the metaphor she uses, the image, and I love it because it gets to the effort. It's hard to go, when you're on a moving sidewalk, you're like, oh no, I'm not supposed to be here, to turn around and walk in the other direction mm -hmm. faster, that takes some effort. Mm -hmm. And yes. Combating racism and the harm of violent whiteness in this country takes effort, and it's going to take all of us. So I'm glad that, that you felt jostled a little bit by what I had to say, Roger. Yes? Piggybacking on what you said and what you said earlier, can you talk a little bit more about the phenomena of passing? I mean, I, I think it's particularly relevant to the gay community that we, because we aren't identifiable, most of us, so we can pass. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as, as a person, I have kids, right? So I pass at their school if I choose to. Um, I, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that phenomena and what the, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if you call it responsibility or what the, what the forward action is around mm -hmm. passing. Thank you. What is your name? Melanie. <clears throat> Melanie. W.B. Du Bois said that identity is in part how you see yourself and in part how society sees you. In my life, I feel that other people foisted a sense of identity onto me um, when I was young. And as of I've lived, um, that ratio has shifted so that my sense of self is now a much greater fraction of my identity than what other people see me or how they label me or what they think of me. So my personal experience has been um, that while our identities are both externally derived and internally derived, my personal experience is that over time I get to decide. Um, I'm not saying that that's true for you, but I offer it as um, something that is true for me. Um, Identity is a very personal thing. It is also a very political thing. And we get to decide, at the end of the day, am I choosing to identify with a group? Um, there are a couple reasons why we might, to find belonging, which we're all desperately in search of, to be in community with people who know us, get us, see us for who we are, love us for who we are. Often that has a great deal to do with race and ethnicity and sexual orientation and um, gender and religion and so on. Um, so often we seek belonging um, 
to be loved and seen and held and to know we matter. Uh, but sometimes there's a political component to that. And so where we actively choose to show up in community says something. It's like wearing a button or having a banner um, or being on the radio. You know, all of a sudden now we are not just finding belonging in that community, but advocating for the needs of that community. And um, to do that is a very public act of identity. Um, and you don't have to be a member of a group to raise the sign and care about mm -hmm. the group and so on. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think identity is deeply personal, deeply complex. Um, the notion of passing, which is what, um, you know, through the practice of slave owners, <coughs> masters, raping slaves, the population of American slaves, of Africans who became American slaves and African Americans, we got, in some cases, lighter and lighter and lighter. Mm -hmm. The one drop rule was put in place to be sure that any offspring from that union, one drop of black blood meant you were black. And that holds still to this day in our prejudice about skin color. Um, um, nevertheless, people for centuries in the African American community have been able to pass. The lighter they got, they saw that there's a better life to be had out there as if I can pass for white. I can get a job, I can live without fear of being violently attacked on the basis of my race. I can, can likely have a slightly better life, but it meant drawing a line and never being with your family again. So while there is privilege that comes with passing, and most people can't, many people can't pass, certainly around race, you know, um, uh, most people can't pass, but to choose to pass um, is sometimes to be given greater opportunity. But as I said earlier, it leaves behind this home in the soul, it's like the people who actually love you for who you are and are not ashamed of you, you've just said goodbye to them forever. Mm -hmm. And there's pain in that. Now, I can't speak to what that's like um, as a member of the queer community. I myself am bisexual, but being bisexual is a whole lot easier than being biracial. Um, <laughs> it's not the same kind of axis or choice making or binary or what have you. Somebody had me on the radio talking about this, and I was like, do I really want to be on the radio talking about this? <laughs> um, um, they didn't know I was bisexual, so I was like, does he know? Is he asking me? Um, boy, I'm saying so much more than I should be. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, um, back to you. Um, can I add one thing to Yeah. That when you... Go ahead. Say, when, stand up. That when you pass, you miss the opportunity to educate. Yes. Mm. Mm. Yes. You, you, you risk being told, oh, hi, Effin. You risk being told that uh, you're not like the others. You're special somehow. You're different. Mm -hmm. You're normal. You're normal. You're normal. You're normal. <laughs> um, but you miss the opportunity to show that black people are like me, too. So that, that's, yeah, that's the that's another side to that. Sometimes it gets to be, I understand what Melanie means. Sometimes, yes. do I want to sit here and have this discussion? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do I want mm -hmm. you to think that, this, that I'm married to a yes. man? Yes. Well, I want to say that really, it's you know, cool. I, I actually you don't. Feel like yeah, but I actually don't choose to pass yeah. because, I, I don't know, I've been in gay communities since I was a child. So for me, I don't have the same. Uh, maybe the same baggage, whatever. When kids ask me why does Sam have two mothers, I say because he's lucky. And because that's actually how I feel. Yeah. Like I know his life and I know that he's a lucky human. Um, not because he's got me, but you know, <laughs> in general. Um, but I'm really curious about what kinds of choices we as gay people get to make and I'm hesitant to say this, but actually need to make in relation to how we make a relationship to the way that white people uh, will other others. You know what I'm saying? Like what kinds of choices do we get to make every day that lose our protectiveness, like lose our protection in some way, you step out mm -hmm. um, on behalf of those who can't pass yeah. or don't. I, I guess that's really what I'm trying to say yeah, is what do we do? How do we do it? And how do we do it and stay safe? So let's talk about allyship. Um, a lot of people want to know how to be an ally. Whatever their identity is, they want to be an ally to people in marginalized communities. And 
Um, I think to be an ally is first to um, care, but to listen and to believe. Many of us who are members of marginalized groups are told that when we say something happened to us or we had an experience, we're told it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen the way we thought it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't act like a victim or we should get over it. Mm -hmm. And um, so to be an ally is to say that I'm listening to you or to actively ask, you know, this and that has happened. How are you doing? How are you feeling? You know, when Charlottesville happens and the white supremacists and the Nazis are marching unhooded. Um, in 2016, you know, to say like, you know, this must be hard for you, um, you Jewish person, you black person, you know, targeted by the Nazis or by the white supremacists, um, you know, let me take an interest in your story, um, is great allyship. But then also to use whatever privilege you have in that moment, and it's very contextual because, you know, I have socioeconomic privilege, you know, I'm an African American, but I have light skin privilege, you know, I, each one of us quite likely has some privilege in some way, not every one of us, but many of us have a privilege we can offer to somebody else in a moment. Mm -hmm. And if we can be that ally who says, I'm listening, I believe you, and when you're ready to go out in the world and tell your truth, I will flank you. I will be beside you, not in front of you, not telling your story for you, okay, but near you, next to you, to the side, ready to step up and use my privilege to help you feel safe, to help you feel seen and heard. Yes? Um, two things. One, that was great. Mm -hmm. One, I think that um, not passing is really a big part of um, how gay people have made so much progress because people came out to people they worked <laughs> with, to their families, and the more people who came out, the more people who already loved them, who already knew them, who accepted them, who respected them, it became um, something that was respected and honored more broadly because you were on the other I mean a lot of people are on, on the yeah. other side of that and they I'm sure they still are but the fact that you don't pass the fact that you are you're honest and true about who you are in whatever context it is because you wouldn't want to hire you wouldn't want to hang around with somebody who who really was a racist yeah. or a yeah. homophobe but That's right. the other part of that is that even for us in this white community that we live in um, for instance I was at over at Outer Cape the other day and um, I was waiting for a prescription or whatever I was waiting for. And Jay, who is um, Billy and Gina's um, uh, tenant, big tall black man, can't miss him, um, he came out and called this, this, uh, this elderly woman whose, whose uh, son was with her. And she, he got up and I yelled at, like I do, Jay, and said, hello, how are you doing? And this guy shot me and looked like, you know him? I got up and I walked over to Jay and gave him a hug. I thought, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't have to say anything, because you know what? I could have been angry. I could have said, what are you, what yeah. are you looking at? Yeah. But instead, I did something else. Yeah. Uh, just reminds me of an example of when I was in um, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, actually, where our slave ancestor lived. I was there on book tour and got some tickets to see a, a gulla band, mm -hmm. Ranky Tanky, mm -hmm. uh, perform at the Dock Street Theater, and was there with a colleague of mine who um, is an artist who really helps me think through issues of being in community with people uh, around these topics, a colleague named Jay Marie, who is gender non-binary, uh, and, um, and Jay Marie walked into the women's bathroom and felt nervous, and I could see Jay Marie's nervousness. I could see the looks on some of the faces of the women. Mm -hmm. So I walked in there and I just announced, hey Jay Marie, I'm in here, you know. Um, and Jay Marie said, thanks, you know, or, or hi Julie or something like that. And it was just my way of signaling, like, mm -hmm. first of all, to them, you're not alone. I got you, you know, but also to anybody else, like, you got a problem with this, you got a problem with me, you know. Yeah, so this is this is allyship in action, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, let me go to you. Your name again, I met you earlier. Larry. Larry. Um, uh, two things, a couple of things. A lot of what you're, you've gone through, I have two biracial daughters. Daughters, yeah. And, um, and sons, two, two okay. sons. But, um, and also too, another thing you said that really gripped with me, growing up with a mom who lived in Birmingham, who, constantly told me I married your dad to like you <coughs> so that you'd 
and have a better life. Mm -hmm. So that resonated with me uh, a lot. Mm -hmm. So like, especially, I've never heard anyone say, but I've said to myself, that's why my wife was white, and that's why yeah. my husband is now white. Yeah. Uh, it's because mm -hmm. of that, those images of, you know, mm -hmm. I want better looking grandkids, mm -hmm. my mom would say. <coughs> because she was trying to save the family. Yeah. Uh, another thing, another thing I this want to This is how colorism and racism mm -hmm. distorts our sense yeah. of yes. self as people of color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. White folks may not realize this, right? The extent to which we yes. can't, you know, these messages pervade, they invade, they infest and infect us and distort our sense of self. And to speak the truth of it out loud, is, I'm sorry, I know you have another thing to say. I'm but sorry, yeah, I'm not but that's good. Right? Yeah. But it's like, when I went out on the Stanford campus that day, finally loving myself as a black woman, it was like they'd all gotten a memo, mm -hmm. Larry, saying, smile at Julie today. Everybody <laughs> smile at Julie. And of course, they had not gotten a memo. I was finally able to see myself that's so I could see them. It was, that is like psychology 101. And I've had yeah. that experience. Okay. But I wanted to say to Melanie, yeah. another thing, there's um, only since I've moved to the Cape, as a gay male, man, white people can't get over the fact of the, see, I'm talking when I'm out of province now, that I'm black, yeah. that I'm gay. Yeah. So for the first time, I'm approached with they, I'm right here, they are taking over our city. Oh. <laughs> they are, because they see me as black, yeah, but, but they, they don't, don't know that gay. I'm gay. Yeah. And yeah. as a teacher in the school system, yeah. the kids know that I have a husband, yeah. but they don't. I um, see. And so then, then I have to make a choice right. to either come out and say, right. hey, wait a minute. That's right. But uh, another thing, working in Mashpee <coughs> High School, <coughs> having a student say, are you, are you gay? Or, or they, she didn't even say that. Yeah. She said something else that was more derogatory okay. and wanting to get me to react. Yeah. And I and there's other kids around me and choosing. And I said to her, "Listen," and I said, um, "My experience is that when someone is that angry mm -hmm. or around something, they're dealing with those feelings themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to come to my office <laughs> and talk about it, <laughs> and I changed this, I changed the subject and went on yeah. because she wanted to date me yeah. because oh, their yeah. powers." We're talking about my gayness, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and so she then thought she would challenge me in school yeah. uh, with the kids, yeah. and so I was just wanted to share that. Thank yeah. you for all of the job. Thank you. Well. <coughs> um, I'm aware. Yes. Okay. We're going to take a couple more questions. I just want to be respectful of the fact that the library will be closing in about a half an hour, yeah. and Jeff is here from the bookstore and wants to sell books, and I too want to sell you books. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me take a couple more questions. Yes. Um, many of you know that Ken and I are involved with uh, our, our uh, orphanage in Tanzania yeah. and um, speaking of um, the individuals, women and men in Tanzania, strive to have their skins lightened also. So it's mm -hmm. not just a phenomenon. It's here. mostly in the city. Where Is this in Arusha? No, no, in Darsal. Okay. Okay. We're in a town of Bagamoyo. Yeah, there's, there's, there's like a, it's like an it's epidemic of skin yeah. whitening. Yeah, mm. my sister's so, talking about Nibia. Nibia yeah. Korean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Nibia has a thing up, and I, I saw it in, in Africa that they have billboards up that said talks about lightening yeah. skin. Yeah, right. Yes. They have that in Darsal. Yes. Right. I, oh, Which, goodness, so our culture has the Caucasian back in a very bad way. Yeah. 20% of the globe is are people who are not of color. Only 20%. No. Yes. yes. It's, it's part of the British Colombia. There's a reason. So what's happening in Tanzania is also happening all over the continent of Africa, and maybe the rest of the world. And what I'm saying is, it's a legacy of the British colonial sure. empire. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't they the ones that invented the concept of race? Oh, I'm sure. sure. <laughs> but so I had a friend that said that, and I didn't, wasn't listening really at the time. It was years ago. <laughs> but went on and on about that it was the British during the colonial empire, that, the, that there was no, before that, a real sense of race as a construct that delineated people on a mm. hierarchical scale. The British invented slavery. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. was one of the hardest things for me to But didn't the caste system in India predate that? 
it may have. And so, yeah. so, yeah. so yeah. I'm wondering. Isn't yeah. this fascinating? But what's yeah. it on? <laughs> but, what's the cast? but we can all learn more. But we yes, the yeah. point is, is that based on race? It is centuries old and not just in America. Sure. I'm going to go to Laurie Schaller, who is my uh, copy yeah. editor, who yeah. came all the way across the water from Mathis Vignette. I just want to say how amazing your group. Great reader, and you're so good to the dick, which is what I would say. My for my tradition, which is I like it. It's very. Uh, it takes a lot of courage to say what you've said, and I'm wondering because you have a big presence on, in social media, and I'm wondering with this huge tour that you've been on, have you had any pushback? Have you had any? You've got a really warm Yeah. Not yet. Mm -hmm. and, and, but 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 I think I'm just getting started. Yeah. And so my book tour, yeah. my book tour was October into mid November, then the holidays happened. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm on this kind of final big swing for two weeks. Massachusetts, Atlanta, Connecticut, Cleveland, then I go back to California. Mm -hmm. And um, the audiences have been bigger, even in small towns. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if I had come to P-Town, I mean, even with all the evangelizing of my family, you know, I just, I think some of you are, you, some of you, may have heard of my book. Maybe you heard me on the radio, okay, whatever. I don't know, but the audiences are getting bigger. It's a pretty woke town. It's also a woke town. I'm just saying that I'm just, Thank like you. even in Concord and Natick, I just had bigger audiences mm -hmm. than I had in communities where I would have expected to have a bigger audience. In the fall, I had smaller audiences that I'm having now. Mm -hmm. And so the book is getting a little bit more well-known. And, mm -hmm. and I'm just trying to say that as that happens, uh, the haters are going to find out about it. Yeah. So right now it's just the choir that comes, like, oh yeah, I want to go listen to this talk about this memoir on race. Um, but, um, um, so far, I mean, I have got one obnoxious guy on Twitter, um, but he has about 36 followers, so I'm not worried about him. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I'll tell you what's harder. Um, so that will be hard when, when um, the mess comes. Um, but what I get all the time is people coming up to me in a book signing line with their own story about mm -hmm. what they've experienced. Mm -hmm. And the language that I hear is, you cracked open something in me right. about Aww. their experience, and then they share it, and I feel it, and we're holding hands, and I'm grateful, and they're, and what I am um, overjoyed by is the trust. Hmm. It's like, yeah, I've dared to put this out in a memoir, and now you're daring to say it out loud to yourself and to me, who was a stranger to you until a few hours ago, and we are in the space of sharing the truth of our existence and our fears and what's made us not like and love ourselves, and to say it helps heal us from it. Yes. I know it. So I'm in the presence of people doing that, which is such a beautiful thing. When I was in Baltimore, I, tell you, I was in a crowd in a library, the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm. There was a white family there, a former colleague of mine from Stanford, Marietta, who brought her, her husband and her young children, eight and five. And her little five-year-old girl, on the drive home, said to her mother and father, five years old, I know she was talking to my ears, but it felt like she was talking in my heart. Oh. And when I heard that, I was like, okay, out of the mouth of babes. Because like what she just described there was compassion, okay? Her little heart started to stir because of something I said. Well, if we could all find a way to grow the compassion we can offer to people not like us, this would be a better place. All right, some of y'all are dying to say things, yes. Um, well, I'm just, I'm just struck by how approachable this conversation has been today mm -hmm. and the way you write, your humor. Uh, you, you, you have a, a, like a method of talking about this subject in a way that this country so greatly needs right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, what's the practical side? Like, how can we take this method that you have and, and multiply it? Like, you know, with your academic <coughs> training, for example, I mean, I could see curriculum, you know, for teachers coming from you, your approach, talking to white America, your, your ideas, the way you've approached this going into the school system and helping train the trainers and yeah. you know like I'm just amazed by well, how approachable it is and, and how I greatly needed you are in our world today. I appreciate that. That's very kind. Let me tell you something though. I'm not just talking to white America. The people of color who are sitting in this room heard things from me oh, yeah. that they needed to hear. They needed to hear I'm not alone. 
someone else has felt the way I felt, someone else has experienced the things I have. So I appreciate that that it's a safe place yeah. for all of us I to talk. And I love that. It's very rare. And I love that. And this is not my work. I am a lawyer turned university administrator turned writer. I am not skilled at running workshops. But I do work with somebody, Jay Marie, um, who is. And as we make our way with this book, um, we will respond to you know the yeah. request. Can you come and work with us for a half day? Well, I know that I can send Jane Marie and their people, um, and I'm excited about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Julie, uh, I wanted you to know that I uh, purchased your audio book, ah. and you're a wonderful reader. Thank you. And mm -hmm. the okay. thing that's really joyous about listening to you read the book is that uh, you have so much more passion than one is used to in, in an audio book, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it's your story, it's very passionate, but it's it's what Val's saying, it's not angry, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. just really passionate, mm -hmm. and it's a great, you're really a good reader, you should know that. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. I uh, my, my book is a prose poetry memoir, for those of you mm -hmm. who are nerds around craft and form. Um, there are places where the prose violates the rules of syntax, where I've let the language, or I've tried to get the words uh, to reflect my feelings, my beliefs, and so on. So if you get it and you're like, did she intend that? This is yes, yes, she intended that. Yes. But also, there's a, there's a wide right margin on every page. Yes. Every page. And some people said, oh, that's great. I can take notes. And yes, you can. But this is um, the constraint of my voice on the page as a woman of color. Yeah. This is the page, and I have access to this much of it, not the full page. Um, it's a serif, it's a sans serif font. Um, I had to fight with my publisher on this. They said, people can't read sans serif. You know, no little doohickeys yeah. on the font. It's not a fancy font. It's just, you know, like, yeah. Arial. It's not Arial, but it's, you know, a plain font. They said, people can't read that. I said, they're going to have to learn because this voice is not got the flourish of serifs. Um, I, I had to insist at every turn that they, you know, not break my words with a, um, with a hyphen and <coughs> onto the next page. They had as publishers work to do in allowing this to be a work of prose poetry. <coughs> it's a nonfiction book they can slap on the page however they want it. Um, so I hope you'll see that. I appreciate that you've got the audio book. I worried when I read it that the engineers were going to make me re-record some of the more emotional sections. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'd, be, I'd pause and say, do you want to take that again? They say, no. Nope. Yeah. You know, this sounds like the way the book is supposed to be. And I will say I am angry. A lot of anger at how black people are treated in this country. Sure. And, um, and I'm not apologetic about that. I think uh, I'm awakened to um, what is happening in this nation in, in my time. And I'm just interested in being part of the solution instead of part of the problem. And when we pass, we are part of the problem. genuine you are really good you, you speak who you well are. thank you and I have worked at that you know I was yeah. a child who didn't know who she was didn't like who mm -hmm. she was and was trying to be who you might have wanted me to be you broadly speaking mm -hmm. and as I came to love myself and then my own voice got really clear in my own head and now I'm just interested in being um, a truth teller and I'm interested mm -hmm. in that for all of us you know mm -hmm. um, not an angry truth teller I mean when I'm trying to be in community I want to be um, speak in a way that mm -hmm. listen in a way that is uh, allows um, for people to be with one another and learn from one another and love one another. Um, so I appreciate that you felt that the voice came out. The hands are going up. I'm gonna go to the to the very back. Yes, yeah, see your name? Thank you. Swade. 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 Hi, Swade. Hi, Melody. Can you sing your question? <laughs> <laughs> that was that chaos. Well, here's what we're, okay, go ahead, Swade. Um, I just wanted to say one more thing about the passing conversation. I had a really powerful experience several years ago when I was um, a co-leader of a seminar. And the, the conversation of passing and whether to come out or not came up. And of course, you know, obviously it's really loaded for a lot of us. And one woman was sitting over at the very edge of the other edge of the circle and just sort of trembling a little bit. And finally she spoke. I was so thrilled. And she said, I'm an elementary school teacher in Alabama. <clears throat> and I'm a lesbian. And she definitely, absolutely would have no trouble passing. And she said, I can't pass. I mean, I have to pass or I can't do my work. Yeah. And she, yeah. and her point, the most important point she was making was, I feel so much pressure from the gay community 
mm. to come out, come out, come out, come out, stop passing, stop yeah. passing. And she was trembling as she yeah. saying this. Yeah. And I thought, dear God, don't forget the people in our community. But, you know, it's got to be a person's choice. Uh, absolutely. And they have yeah. to feel well, safe to right. be able to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we be allies to them yeah. to feel safe, yeah. to get to that turning point that yeah. you spoke of so, so yeah. well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was about yeah. being comfortable with yourself. Same thing yeah. with people with Alzheimer's, too. You guys, yeah. here's what's happening. I'm a stranger who showed up this afternoon, and I go somewhere else tomorrow. <laughs> I appreciate your being here with me around my work for these moments. This conversation predated my arrival, mm -hmm. and it I joined it, and now I'm leaving, but you all will continue <laughs> to talk amongst yourselves about the various <laughs> aspects that matter to you, which I respect. Um, I'm just trying to um, be mindful of the fact that the library does close mm -hmm. in about 25 minutes. We need minutes. to buy some books. And um, so we have to move this portion of our gathering out.